hablar um, sobre este tema, uh, and I have to say uh, in advance, in light of what happened this week in Paris, it might appear a little too optimistic. Uh, I wrote this over a number of years, uh, and I tried to identify, can you hear me? Okay? No, Okay. How's that? I wrote this over a number of years at a point in time when I think uh, there were certain trends evident. Now there's some question marks, but we can talk about that in the question and answer. So the topic is the role that these five rising democracies play in the international order. And I'm talking about five specific countries, India, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, and Turkey. And the question I'm asking myself is, as they become more important players in the international scene, will this help or set back our long struggle for human rights and democracy in the world? And I'm, my proposition is that is the answer depends on the role that these five countries in particular, and there are others, of course, that will play an important role, and I would include Argentina and Mexico and South Korea. But I focus on these five countries as both examples of transition of democracy and supporters of liberal ideas, but also potential promoters of these ideas. So why did I choose these five countries? All five of these countries have made important leaps from what were closed economies and illiberal governance to something more open and accountable. These are all countries that are works in progress. Democracy is not a final end state, it's a process. There's no such thing as a perfect democracy, including the United States, let me make that very clear up front. Um, these countries are facing major challenges. But if you compare their status to years before their transitions toward more liberal systems, you see a direct contrast. And I'm going to go over that in some detail. These are all very diverse societies with multiple languages, ethnicities, castes, religions, um, that really demonstrate the universal value of democracy. They've all, in response to the demand for change that is coming through electoral systems, accountable systems, governments are adjusting their policies and providing much greater uh, forms of, of welfare. They've all uh, made this kind of progress within a democratic context, so very much an, an antidote to the example of China, which also has made tremendous progress in terms of socioeconomic change, but doing it within a closed authoritarian system. And all five of these states would like a greater voice in the international order, uh, but when it comes to their participation, their leadership on issues of democracy and human rights, they have a very mixed and weak record. So just a word about methodology. Uh, we started this process over four years ago. Uh, we commissioned research from experts in all five of these countries. I then did field research in all five countries, talking to a group of diplomats, businessmen, civil society, journalists, etc. I collected a tremendous amount of data, which you'll see on the future slides, comparing these countries to their experience before and after their turning points, their transitions to more liberal systems. Then I go deeply into their foreign policy history and give a sense of how it has changed. And then I've tried to come up with policy recommendations for where there might be convergence between the established traditional democracies and these newer rising democracies from the South. We, when we look at this question, we look at it in terms of democracy and development. And if you compare their, uh, as I said, periods before and after their transition milestones, you'll see that they've made substantial progress, both in terms of economic development, human development, and political liberalization within this broader context of globalization and the third wave. Now, if you just look at issues of governance and rights, 
you see major improvements, which is not surprising. They were all moving toward democratic systems. Major improvements in terms of civil and political rights, civilian control, military, which of course uh, Argentina has a very important experience on that front. Greater contributions to peacekeeping operations. Uh, a reduced role for the state in the economy, which has a mixed um, view, depending on your political point of view, but it does allow for greater freedom in the economy for individuals to uh, create businesses. If you look more recently, there is stagnation and backsliding. Uh, so there's this initial increase and improvement, and then a flattening out and even a decline, particularly in a country like Turkey. So they are not the best performers, but they're not the worst performers either. They're somewhere in the middle. This slide just shows you, in the Freedom House scores, how they've changed the lower the score, the better, in terms of Freedom House scores. So Indonesia has made a dramatic uh, change. South Africa, of course, moving from apartheid to uh, democracy. And on average, their score has gone from 3.4 to 2.6, which is in the right direction. But this shows, uh, this is the World Bank collects a variety of information on what they call voice and accountability. And they look at different dimensions of governance, including corruption and rule of law. And you'll see the initial, particularly at the bottom two graphs, uh, improvement for Indonesia and Turkey, and then a straight line or flattening out uh, or decline. Now, if you turn to economic growth, uh, you get a similar improvement, even more dramatic. Uh, remarkable progress on GDP per capita in all five countries. The volatility of economic growth stabilizes. So democracy, it suggests that democracy helps support stability in economic growth. Dramatic declines in inflation, which of course puts more money in people's pockets. But in all cases, unemployment has increased and inequality has uh, increase as well. Some declined, but overall that's the story. And how have governments responded? Democratic governments are more responsive to their citizens, to the voters, and they've expanded social benefits uh, across the board. This is, I'm, I can go quickly over the graphs. This one uh, shows the period before and after transition. Uh, Brazil has had the most dramatic increase in terms of GDP per capita, uh, but Turkey and South Africa also greatly this shows the stability of growth, and the big swings show instability, and the smaller swings show less. This one as well, average instability, the lower the number, the better. And then this shows the decrease in, in inflation. Brazil is not shown in this chart, I should note, because of their period of hyperinflation was dramatic enough that it skewed the, uh, the analysis. And then inequality, you'll see, has gone down a little bit in Brazil. Uh, South Africa has the worst level of inequality. Uh, the others are, are lower, but not really changing much. Now, let's look about not just economic development, but human development, because democracy generally cares about how its citizens are doing. And as a result of this liberalization reforms that these countries took, you see major improvements in human development across the board. Big drops in poverty, life expectancy improves, infant mortality declines, literacy rates improve, and there are more students in school going to stay in school longer, including for women and girls. This is a collection of data that the UN puts together every year called the Human Development Index, and they've been collecting it since 1980. And this shows the progression over time, both before and after their transitions, and you see the improvement continues during their democratic uh, democratization periods. So particularly Brazil uh, and Turkey, but all of these states have made important improvements on a range of uh, social indicators. And just to highlight a couple of examples, infant mortality has dramatically declined across the board with the exception of South Africa. And the next chart shows you why. Uh, you'll see life expectancy increasing over time, but look at that blue line with the arrow <coughs> pointing. That's South Africa. And the breakout is the prevalence of HIV AIDS, which really skyrocketed in South Africa at, 
really a, a failure of policy, a failure of the government to respond to the crisis, and as a result, uh, they had very bad performance on infant mortality uh, and maternal mortality as well. They've been spending a lot more money, the health expenditures are going up, and that problem seems to be leveling off. Brazil, on the right-hand side, screens took a very different approach, addressed it head-on, and uh, have a much lower incidence of HIV as a result. Now, all this is happening within the context of globalization. And during this time, all five of these countries embraced globalization, expanded international trade and exports, welcomed foreign direct investment, and you see a major change in the, in the trading pattern. So instead of all the goods going from south to north, they're increasingly going south-south. And of course, that includes China being a major driver of the change, but not just China. Um, when it comes to these countries then, as they become richer, becoming donors instead of recipients of development assistance, it's a mixed picture. Turkey, to my surprise, is one of the top donors, uh, particularly on humanitarian assistance. And that was before the crisis with Syria and the number of uh, refugees that they're hosting. Um, Brazil and India still both give and, and receive the development assistance, and Indonesia is still receiving it. Of course, you all know the story of internet access, mobile phones, uh, remittances are very important for all these countries, particularly India. So these countries have more and more of a stake in what's happening in other parts of the world because their citizens are sending lots of money back home and contributing to their economy. And there's just a much greater increase in travel and study abroad, uh, both ways. So more foreigners coming to visit their countries and the other way around. So this process of globalization, I argue, is a really important part of the story. These are a couple slides that show foreign direct investment um, and the big increase in particular in Brazil, which is the top line in, in red. And this specifically looks at Chinese foreign direct investment in these five countries. Huge increase in South Africa, you'll notice, and that has had a direct impact on South Africa's foreign policy, and I can get into that in more detail if you'd like. So, in a nutshell, all this data tells us that the liberalization process, both politically and economically, have really brought about significant improvements both in economic, political, and human development terms. These five countries perform above the global average in GDP growth rates and in progress toward the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and so they earned a certain amount of soft power in the world, in, I, would, I would argue, that these have become uh, examples of both democratic and economic liberalization uh, that have benefited uh, the average citizen. So it, it, it posed the question, well, what are they going to do with this soft power? And now I want to turn to what I call the international liberal order. And I have a chapter in the book that just really goes into the elements of what that is. The book will be out, by the way, in end of January, early February. So this is kind of an early preview uh, of what is coming out of it. Uh, but clearly, all of these states have benefited from the process of globalization. And, and the international liberal order. Of course, uh, their, their adoption of democratic systems uh, for their own societies, you know, they've chosen this path, uh, and they, they, are, they like to, you know, they're proud of it, and uh, they, they use that to attract more uh, international investment, but also uh, a greater claim for power on the world stage. Uh, but they're not really on board with the idea of promoting democracy and human rights in other countries. Even though it's been of great value to their own societies, they do not feel comfortable buying into what I call the Western-led international order. These are swing states where concepts of sovereignty, traditional concepts of sovereignty, and what is in the national interest really override an interest in what I call democratic peace theory, which argues that our own national interests are better protected by supporting democracy in other countries. <coughs> because democracies traditionally do not go to war with one another, do not spawn famines or refugees, 
if you look around the world, what's happening right now in the Middle East, I don't think it's coincidence that these states are having so much trouble <coughs> reconciling among themselves because they've not found a language or a mechanism to reach uh, some kind of peaceful reconciliation. Uh, democracies have a much better track record of doing that. Now, if you look at where they come from, these are countries with long histories of colonialism, uh, apartheid, military dictatorships, and they were supported by the West. And that memory doesn't fade away overnight. Um, so you have that history behind you. On top of that, the way democracy promotion has been practiced has been very controversial particularly during the 2000s when the United States invaded Iraq under the guise of uh, democracy uh, at the point of a gun and it has really polarized the whole, and poisoned I would say, the whole business of uh, democracy promotion. And I would say the same for the concept of responsibility to protect, which is a concept that was endorsed by all member states of the United Nations back in 2000 and 2005, and was actually employed in the case of Libya. Um, the UN Security Council authorized use of force to protect civilians, which was unheard of, really a breakthrough, in terms of putting human beings first instead of national security. But that's not the way it played out. The way it played out was, we're going in there to get rid of Gaddafi and regime change. And the states that voted for it, including India and Brazil and South Africa, really regret it because they see the responsibility to protect doctrine as a way to the West imposing its own uh, wishes on other countries. And look, on top of that, look what's happened in Libya since then. I mean, there was no serious plan to address the chaos that ensued. And including the United States, kind of stepped back and said, okay, now you guys fix that problem, you yourselves, and it's become uh, a hotbed of, of terrorism and chaos. So in the end, I think these five states are very cautious about how do you promote uh, democracy and human rights. They're, they're realists, but they're liberal realists, because they do believe in supporting democratic change uh, in other countries. They accept the basic core elements of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all the human rights treaties, both at the regional and at the international level, but they don't agree with the means that the West has used to defend those rights. And at the end of the day, strategic autonomy is really most important to them. Of course, each of these countries have very important roles to play in, in their own region, and they nonetheless are not true hegemons, I would say, none of these uh, five. They are certainly not accepted as hegemons by their neighbors, hegemons. Um, Brazil is competing with lots of other states, including the United States, for leadership in the Americas. South Africa, during the apartheid era, uh, imposed its will on many of its neighbors, and there's still uh, this ghost of the apartheid era. They don't want to be pushing too hard on their neighbors. India has been relatively passive in asserting itself in South Asia, although that's beginning to change under Modi. The Indonesians have a very soft touch. They very much uh, see themselves as leaders of Southeast Asia and as leaders of the regional organization known as ASEAN. Uh, but they do it in a very soft uh, way. And then, of course, you have the development of BRICS and IPSA. Um, and for some of these states, India, Brazil, and South Africa, they've really lately chosen the BRICS as their primary uh, card in the international political game. And IPSA has uh, declined in prominence. You know, IPSA is a collective of these three democratic states that portray themselves as democracies and caring about political values. But in practice, they really have not operationalized much. And BRICS have gone way ahead, and you can see with the role of Russia and China the way that's playing out in their in their foreign policy. A quick um, side note: my general 
observation is that there's a process of democratization of foreign policy going on in all of these countries. There is more room, more space for media, for labor unions, for businesses, for NGOs to monitor, criticize, and influence foreign policy. Parliaments, of course, either directly or through parliaments playing an important role. And what I have here and in the book are a number of examples. Uh, we don't have to go into all of them, but they're interesting examples where coalitions of civil society groups have engaged to influence their country's foreign policy in these countries on, on human rights issues. And you can use examples in each of these five countries uh, to support that. Okay. Since we're in South America, I just wanted to spend a minute on, on Brazil. Brazil is really most of one of the clearest cases of the, the doctrine of strategic autonomy, uh, where they have, uh, particularly under President Lula, made a very ambitious uh, graph for regional and global leadership. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, they fall back to principles of sovereignty, uh, non coercive <coughs> Uh, over their own constitution, which calls for uh, human rights being a paramount concern in their, in their foreign policy. Now, there was a very important period in the 80s and 90s where Brazil in particular led the effort to create what I call democracy clauses, uh, which are prominent in this region, which is like an insurance policy against military coups in the top. And that has played a really important role in consolidating democracy in the region. Uh, but as those forms of executive grabs for power have changed, so not just military coups, but other ways of using elections and uh, the judiciary and, and kind of pulling power toward the executive, as those have grown, the inter-American system and the others have not really responded to those uh, cases successfully. Of course, all of these countries are facing massive demands for economic development, and that becomes a uh, priority over a concern for human rights, particularly when they're in conflict. Um, Brazil, I think, is going through a really important moment right now. Uh, I think it will already, we're seeing uh, an effect on their ambitions in foreign policy terms. But I also see in the medium to long term some very positive signs uh, in terms of how their democracy is responding to the crisis. And uh, you see the importance of checks and balances, of a more independent judiciary and prosecutors, and a very active civil society and media that are pushing the system toward accountability for these massive uh, accusations of, of corruption. So there's a silver lining, I think, to the Brazil story, and of course we'll see what happens in, in the coming year or two, how that evolves. So that slide was a little misplaced, but these, going back to the civil society, uh, these are just other examples, um, which I'm happy to talk about <coughs> in the question and answer. Another example from Brazil, an NGO that has really been a lead voice in pressuring their foreign ministry to change their positions on human rights in the United Nations, on countries like Iran and, and North Korea. They, they trained a lot of activists from throughout the global south. So a couple of final uh, thoughts. Um, I, I think that there are many opportunities for win-win outcomes between North and South on these issues. But it starts probably, in my view, with the traditional democracies getting their house in order and practicing what they preach. I mean, the United States in particular has been the loudest voice pushing other countries to move toward democracy and human rights, and yet it faces huge gaps in its own practice on these issues. And I'm happy to go into that in more detail. But as an American, uh, seeing what's happening in my country is a great concern. And that is a very common notion. Uh, the reason you're seeing outsider candidates like Donald Trump doing so well is because people are sick and tired of how the system is working <coughs> and feel that money in particular has really corrupted uh, the way business is done. 
So we need to fix our own house. Um, it doesn't mean you stop supporting democracy and human rights in other countries, but it does mean you have to do a much better job of practicing what you preach. And understanding where these five countries in particular are coming from, given their own history, and given the history of the West in supporting periods of dictatorship and, and apartheid. One question is whether there's a grand bargain here, as these states like Brazil want a permanent seat on the UN Security Council, there could be a better understanding of what of them buying into the international liberal order than we currently see in practice. The um, question is how do you get there? But I think that is a question that's on the table. Um, you also, I think, see a proliferation of regional institutions and mechanisms, um, some of them quite positive, but not always aligned with the international norms. And so there's a danger that as the world splits into regional blocks, that you could have an undermining of the universal principles that have been constructed over the last 50 years. So one way to deal with this is more work can be done to build cross-regional coalitions of democracies. And this is already happening at the UN Human Rights Council through organizations like International IDEA in Sweden and through the community of democracies that are trying to build these kinds of cross-regional networks. Here, based on the consultations I've done, I throw out some uh, specific ideas where there might be win-win solutions. These are concerns that cut across all uh, democracies. Uh, civil society is very much under attack, and not just in Russia. Uh, it's happening in India, it's happening in Ukraine, and many other countries. Um, this is a, a major concern. You need civil society, whether you're working on women's rights, or economic and social rights, housing rights, or political rights, internet rights, you need to have the ability to operate and have freedom of association. And that's a major concern. Um, with the proliferation of the internet, uh, you need to have uh, freedom of the internet uh, and the ability for citizens to access information. I think corruption is one of the big signature issues that all societies are facing. And uh, much more work can be done in that area. When you talk about human rights in the global south, what you're first going to hear are basic rights of food, water, shelter, health. And in the north, particularly in the United States, we don't really talk about those as rights. These are benefits that are provided uh, by government, but they're not seen as rights that you can litigate in court for. Well, I think we need to get over that. These are rights under international law. And there are many ways in which they can be uh, addressed. So I think there's a lot of room for uh, collaboration on those issues. Many, many studies show that the more you educate women and girls, the more benefits you will have across society in multiple domains. It's a no-brainer. And so we need to make a massive leap in our uh, support for education for girls and, and women. And then finally, with the rise of the private sector and businesses, transnational companies around the world, uh, you need to bring them into the system and hold them accountable to a set of international norms on that front. Last slide. Uh, I think these states, I'm more optimistic, I think these states have the potential to become more active supporters of, of liberal norms, uh, but they want to do it on their own terms. Uh, some countries, particularly some elites, are really their primary focus is on counterbalancing the United States. That comes first, and, and the West. And that, I think, has proven to be an obstacle to finding this common ground on democracy and human rights. And a, a much greater preference for the flexibility that comes with strategic autonomy, where you have multiple uh, partnerships with multiple countries uh, and, and fewer alliances that are really uh, meaningful. I think the United States needs to revisit the uh, costs and benefits of their uh, choice of, of tools for promoting democracy and human rights. I think President Obama understands that to a degree, uh, but I'm not so sure if the Republicans win in 2016 uh, what we're going to get. The role of civil society and other voices in, in democratizing foreign policy will continue, so there will be more and more pressure from below and from other institutions. But I think that cuts both ways. You'll have interest groups that want their country 
X that's not going to be a pro-human rights kind of position versus a more cosmopolitan civil society that sees the value of having an international system of norms that and mechanisms that can then work to put pressure on their own uh, domestic situations. Finally, you might all know about the Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted in September at the UN General Assembly. Uh, these provide a great opportunity to connect the development goals with democracy and human rights. And there are, there's a very important goal in there that supports access to justice, rule of law, uh, accountable institutions, that really uh, puts the resources behind the development assistance connected to good governance, good democratic governance, as uh, the way forward. That's it. I look forward to your questions.